Hi there, Facebook. I'm back again for the second time today. Divisional round playoff day on Saturday, another one on Sunday. And how about them Patriots? No Cowboys, but I still got Tom Brady in the tournament. I still picked the Patriots to win it all. I picked them to win tonight, 34-13. to and it was 35 to 14. Sue me. I'm coming to you live once again from the west side of Los Angeles in Century City here in Casa Ernestine. <laughs> she runs this household. Our little Maltese Hazel, who usually makes a cameo about this point in the conversation on Facebook Live, is being punished tonight because Ernestine is going out of town and had all of her vitamins laid out and Hazel got into them and ate a bunch of them. And I don't know, it was like sugar pills or something. She went completely crazy. She was barking at the front door at nobody. She wouldn't stop. And she's in the quote unquote doghouse right now. So Ernestine said she gets no shot tonight on Facebook Live. But I'm about to talk about Tom Brady and the Patriots and why I believe the Jaguars, to my dismay, are going to upset Pittsburgh at Pittsburgh tomorrow. Quick thought on the first game. I know there's Twitter controversy over Julio Jones. I tweeted this immediately at the end of the Atlanta-Philadelphia game. I didn't get deep into it on my first Facebook Live, but just a quick thought as everyone joins us here tonight on my version of Facebook Live. I didn't mind the play call on fourth and whatever it was, two, make or miss, win or lose, sink or swim. I picked the Eagles because I thought the Falcons had struggled on offense and lost their way much of the year. I know they caught a little bit of fire later, but they wound up 15th in the NFL on offense with the reigning MVP. So they put the ball in the hands of the reigning MVP, throwing to what many believe is the best receiver in football, Julio Jones. And Julio slipped down. You can argue he got a small push, but on a play like that, you just have to let them play. I didn't think it was any hold or push or illegal contact or certainly pass interference. The turf was not good all night for either team in Philadelphia. And yet Matt Ryan continued to roll and then threw it up high where Julio usually rises and snatches and went right through his hands. Julio's had a couple big drops, one in the back of the end zone this year, did not have a great year, nor did his team have a great year. And that was just the kind of ball that Julio routinely snatches, catches, plants, gets both feet down. It looked like his feet wouldn't have gotten down on this one, but that was because he sort of quit on the play after the ball went right through his hands. <clears throat> and as he came down with no football, he didn't try to stick his feet in fair territory. So it was just a fitting in to what was not meant to be a great year for the the team that made it to the Super Bowl last year and had the greatest collapse in Super Bowl history, thanks to that team I just watched on my TV right here in my little quote-unquote man cave. That team quarterback by the greatest quarterback ever, that team that just demolished the Tennessee Titans with 437 total yards, and went 11 for 17 on third down as that quarterback, that guy Brady, that guy who's 40 years young, just threw for 337 yards and three touchdowns and zero interceptions in little more than three quarters. Hmm. That guy is the NFL MVP. It's not Todd Gurley. It wouldn't have been Carson Wentz. It's Tom Brady. It's just extraordinary what he continues to do. And I said in our first Facebook chat here tonight, right after the Eagles game, pre-Patriots game, that Tom Brady was on a mission tonight for two reasons. Kevin Byard, who had a terrific year for the Titans, put himself on the national map by saying they were going to turn Tom Brady into Blake Bortles. And I pointed out 
on Undisputed, the show you can watch on Fox Sports 1, daily from 9.30 to noon Eastern time, I pointed out to Mr. Byard, young Mr. Byard, in his second year out of Middle Tennessee State, which isn't too far from Nashville, Tennessee, where I went to school at Vanderbilt, but I pointed out to Mr. Byard that <clears throat> Blake Bortles had a better statistical year by a lot than your quarterback back, Kevin, that Marcus Mariota. I'm just not a Mariota fan. If you know me from the old show on ESPN, it was on record before the draft. I just, I just don't buy Mariota as a quarterback. He's got a funky little motion. He doesn't have great arm strength. He actually got off to a hot start tonight and shocked me against the Patriots defense I haven't loved all year. It is ultimate bend but don't break. Ultimate. Again, he was 25th in stopping the opponent on third down. And yet it was fourth in the NFL in red zone defense. Do the math on that. You go bend, 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 but you don't break. Wound up fifth in the NFL in points allowed. That'll work. That'll work Super Bowl-wise. But still, number 12, that quarterback who's 40 years young, the MVP, I believe, I'm not sure he will be because there's such Brady hate out there, there's so much jealousy, so much resentment, so much just just pushback on everything Brady, everything Patriots. I'm just not sure he's going to win it. I think I, I just sense by all that I read that there's late rush, like oh, oh, oh we we can't we can't give it to Tom Brady. We can't. Oh, Todd Gurley, Todd Gurley had two great games at the end of the year. Baloney, baloney. Look at all the other games he wasn't great in. Look at their home losses. Look at their home playoff loss. I know that's not supposed to factor into regular season MVP. But Tom Brady took a pretty average football team that suffered injury after injury, lifted that team to the number one seed, lifted that team to a dominating victory tonight over a Tennessee team that a lot of the experts, including Ray Lewis on Undisputed, we're trying to make a case. Did you hear Tony Romo tonight? Oh, he made a passionate case. Like, people, you don't know what you're talking about. If you think this is going to be a runaway, a blowout, you're so wrong. You just don't get it, said Tony. I love Tony Romo as a broadcaster. I think he's had a sensational rookie broadcast year. But he did not have a good night tonight because he's making this passionate, you don't get it case early in the game against the Patriots, and for Tennessee. You just don't get it. Styles make fights, said Tony Romo, and, and it's a bad matchup for New England. Well, the, the truth is every matchup is a bad matchup for this New England team, except for the quarterback. And how many times tonight did the quarterback check off at the line of scrimmage? You can just see it. You know, whoever, you know, 52 is the mic. You, you hear it. he's picking out the mic linebacker. And then he checks this, he checks that, you're weak here, so I'm going to call this play. And I made the case on Twitter during the game, if Josh McDaniels does leave again to take a head coaching job, God bless him. God bless whoever takes him. I, I just think he's a coordinator, he's not a head coach. I think we saw that to a large extent in Denver. But if he leaves, Tom Brady, and again, now, this is the Brady Belichick clash, but Tom Brady should be allowed next year to call his own plays. Back in the day, a number of quarterbacks did call their own plays. I'm going back into the probably the 60s, maybe some in the early 70s. The star quarterbacks call their own plays. I know one reason that Roger Staubach told me for my book, God's Coach, about the Cowboys is one reason he quit a little prematurely at 38. Remember, he didn't start until he was almost 30 because he went to Vietnam. 28 he started at, actually. But one reason he quit was Tom Landry wouldn't let him call the plays. And, and he just believed he could call them better than God's coach, Tom Landry, could. So in this case, I promise you, Tom, uh, Tom Brady calls basically a lot of plays at the line of scrimmage by checking off audibles. And tonight, he, it was just masterpiece, it, masterpiece theater. You're watching it again. It's masterful to see the way he just manipulates the game. 
and, and his release is just as quick and his velocity is just as strong and his accuracy just as great as ever. And he just controlled the football game. So now I got to go on Undisputed. Again, we're going to be there on MLK Day, Monday. No holiday for us. I don't like holidays. I, honestly, I like I – I don't like – I love what I do. I love Undisputed. I, I've been doing this show basically for – what are we up to? 14 years, dating back to my days at ESPN. It's the same show, basically. It's had a few incarnations. But the point is that I, I just love doing it. But I, I'm going to dread a little bit on Monday. We'll be there same time as always, 930 to noon Eastern time on Fox Sports 1. So please, if, if you're off, or even if you're not off, you could tape us or watch us live. We will be live at 9.30 to noon Eastern time and hope to see you there. But I'm going to have to hear that <laughs> you, you just booked this, that the Patriots stole another game. Did they get a couple of 50-50 calls in the first half? Yeah. Okay, the Decker call. I wouldn't have called that. He was called for offensive pass interference on Malcolm Butler. There's a little push and shove. And it's close. It's a ticky-tack flag. I wouldn't have called it. I'll give you that one. Is it going to change a game that got all the way to 35-7? to seven? No, it's not. And then – now I can't remember what the other one was. But the, I'll flash to the end of the half when it looked like the Patriots shouldn't have gotten the second down. And I, the, the one great point that Tony Romo made tonight was – that he checked with the league office. Now, I was not aware of this. I thought there was home cooking going on where somebody up in Gillette Stadium running the clock let, you know, didn't hit the button fast enough, to, or I, I should say he hit it too fast and, and stopped the clock with the second left that they didn't deserve. But that's done. That's controlled by New York, said Tony Romo. I didn't know that. So, and for that matter, Guskowski missed the – the 53-yard um, field goal that he should have made, which scares me a little bit going to next week because is he getting those demons back that he had a year ago? I hope not. So what was the other one? There's another ticky-tack call that could have gone either way. I'll think of it in just a second. But these, these are just – they're just – oh, I know, the offsides. Yeah, the, the offsides on when it looked like they had them backed up in jail and lean across the line of scrimmage and – you know, again, I would have called. I, I thought that was encroachment. I thought that was breaking the plane for the defensive player. And then the offense moved. So, I don't know. Is that going to change a game that got to 35-7? to seven? No, but trust me, because the Patriots are quote-unquote cheaters, and Tom Brady lied and he cheated during deflate gate, which is the biggest crock I've ever heard in my career. I don't buy a bit of that. But that's what I'm going to hear because there's so much Patriot hate. There's so much Brady hate. There's so much suspicion. There's so much paranoia when it comes to that team. Is Belichick a cheater? Well, he got caught. So I'll give you that part. And he got accused strongly by those first two Super Bowl opponents that he taped or spied on their walkthroughs on Saturday. That would have been the Rams and the Panthers, St. Louis Rams and the Carolina Panthers. And they were strongly on the record that they got spied on. Is that true? Spy gate, he got busted. I'm not the biggest Belichick believer, defender. I don't defend him at all. Do I think he's a great coach? I do. But this team is driven by the quarterback. I'm going to say it again. It's 75% Brady and 25% Belichick. And Belichick has been allowed to get away with a lot of things because his quarterback is Tom Brady. He can ship out a Chandler Jones a, a little early, even though he had a drug issue. He can ship out a Jamie Collins a little early just because he can, just because they can keep mis mixing and matching. And to his credit, he brought that defense back to a boil tonight. And finally, I saw some pass rush on a defense. Again, it, it, my friend Casey Joyner, I mentioned this in our first Facebook tonight, I'm giving him a little pop here tonight on ESPN.com, the football scientist. 
he carefully studies film, Casey Joyner does, of the regular season. He was ranking units, um, offense, defense. But when he got to the Patriots' defense, he gave them an F for their run defense. He gave them an F for their front seven performance for this season. He gave them a C- minus for their pass rush. That team's the number one seed. How is that? Mm, it's the quarterback. He, he covers all your sins, all your evils, because tonight they didn't have much run game tonight. I mean, little Deion Lewis is little Deion Lewis, and so tonight, especially in the second half, that was a game made to order for LeGarrette Blount, the Winnebago. Where is he? Blunt force trauma. Where is he? He's in Philadelphia. It was a game made for little, not little, he's, he's built low and wide wide berth, but little Gillisley, who is, uh, he, he could be a force in Buffalo. And I, I don't know what happened. He's just, he was a big free agent signing for Bill Belichick and, I'm not going to say he's a – I guess I would have to say he's a bust. I don't know. He's a big disappointment. He's been an inactive disappointment most of the year. He got his shots early and just couldn't bring the hammer the way he did in Buffalo on short yards, especially in goal line situations. Had a couple of good runs early and wound up deep in the doghouse. So they didn't have him. And I thought Rex Burkhead was healthy. I thought he was. I thought the – Certainly the two weeks off gave him a shot to be back tonight. No, inactive. So Belichick had no choice but to put the game in number 12's hands and let him throw runs, as in five-yard pass, quote-unquote, handoffs. Dump the ball. Let, let Deion Lewis get out in space a little bit more with little dump passes. Let James White catch some short passes. Some dinks, some dunks, some slices, some dices. But Brady was throwing some rockets to Gronkowski, <laughs> and he was guarded, unfortunately, for him by Kevin Byard. Bye-bye, Byard. That's the end of you, pal. I guess you got your 15 minutes, and now that's enough of that. But now I'm back to the Patriots' pass rush. It was Man, it, it got – I know they could just tee off in the second half, and I know Conklin, the right tackle for the Tennessee Titans, was lost to, they said, maybe a knee injury. It looked like an ankle, but they said knee. Hope he gets better. Hope he's going to be okay. But here they came. They came from everywhere. Even my guy Adam Butler from Vanderbilt University, the best school in America. It's my alma mater. It's in Nashville, Tennessee. But he rose and shone again tonight against the Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee Titans. And they're coming from everywhere. Grissom showed. I saw a little pop from James Harrison, not in the pass rush, but in the run game. And Trey Flowers and Marquise Flowers, and I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, but Alan Branch, who can be a rock in that middle, he was inactive again tonight, so he didn't get healthy through the two weeks. And maybe he will for next week. So they're bringing the defense to a boil right on schedule for what is going to happen next weekend, next Sunday in Foxborough, which will be yet another, I'm losing track, what are they up to? Seven straight AFC championship games? That's unbelievable. That's Tom Brady for you. So here comes either Jacksonville or Pittsburgh. And on undisputed 9.30 noon Eastern time, I picked, unfortunately for me, the Jaguars. Maybe it's a fear pick. Maybe I fear the Jaguars. I know it's an upset. I did pick Philly today. A monumental upset as a home underdog, Nick Foles. So I was right about that. I almost nailed the Patriots score tonight. And I kind of hope I'm wrong about the first game tomorrow. Because the Jaguars scare me more than the Pittsburgh Steelers do. You can argue that the Steelers just have law of average on their side. I, I told somebody last week, I think it was Ray Lewis or maybe Greg Jennings on Undisputed, again, 9.30 noon Eastern time on Fox Sports 1. I told one of them, hey, at some point, the Steelers are there's going to beat the Patriots because it's just life, you know? It's just football. They're, they're just going to. It's just going to happen. I don't know. Like Tom Brady's 11-2 lifetime against the Steelers. 
you know, for his sake and my sake and their sake. I, I hope it isn't this time, but I don't think it's going to be the Steelers. Report tonight, and we talked about this on Undisputed, that Antonio Brown just not right yet. He's not nearly 100%, but he's going to try to go. He's a tough young man. And I'm sure he'll go, and I'm sure he'll have some success. But that Steelers team has been troubled all year. It just hasn't been right. Then it lost Ryan Shazier on defense. And the defense isn't great to begin with, but that was a huge loss. And then you had Mike Tomlin saying before the New England visit, it's going to come down to us and the Patriots. It's just a matter of whether it's going to be in our house or their house. Coach, you're breaking every coaching rule. You're telling another former great coach, Tony Dungy, it's going to come down to us and the Patriots. Well, wait a second. What about the team that came into Pittsburgh and just beat the dog out of you? What, what about the Jacksonville Jaguars who got – a little better and a little better and a little better week after week after week on defense. That's the best defense in pro football. That's on the verge of becoming more, an all-time great defense. I'm seeing the makings of it. They got five freakish athletes on that defense now. And they got maybe five other really good players. I'm not that big a fan of Barry Church. I like him personally former Dallas Cowboy, but he's he's smart. He's been there and done all that at safety for the Jaguars. So they're, real, they're the best defense. I know Minnesota statistically is the best. These guys are the best. They're dominating because they have two good corners and they can flat out rush the passer and they have extremely athletic linebackers. Miles Jack's just freakishly gifted. Jalen Ramsey, freakishly gifted and big for a corner and strong. And I just don't think it was that big a fluke. I know Greg Jennings was making the point that it was a big fluke because it was a close game through a half, and then Ben just fell completely apart and didn't just throw five interceptions. He threw two pick sixes. Well, so all the focus goes to Jacksonville that they can't score. Blake Bortles is not that bad. I'm not a fan. I'm not defending him. I'm just telling you he was 21 touchdowns to only 13 interceptions and a QBR which ranks his overall performance for the year of 56. That's above average, 0 to 100. And it really tells the tale of a quarterback. 56 is above average. 56 was above Mariota. It was above Eli. It was above Andy Dalton. It was above Kirk Cousins. Who am I forgetting? There are a couple more. Obviously, Flacco. Uh, Derek Carr, he's above all those guys, and yet he's become the NFL punchline. Bayard said, we want to turn Tom Brady into Blake Bortles. Well, that's not that terrible a thing because Blake Bortles is better than Marcus Mariota. I just don't like Mariota's feel for the game. I know he can run with it. I know he's a tough guy, but he's deer in headlights. I don't like his feel. I just, I just don't. I think there's a limit to how far he can take that team. I said before the draft, I thought Jameis was a little better than Mariota, and I know he's had his interception woes, and I, that that team, Tampa Bay, it's poorly coached. Now they're going back to Dirk Cutter again because they couldn't get John Gruden, and I feel sorry for Jameis because the GM, they're amateurish. They're high schoolish. That, that hard knocks, that was my takeaway. The GM, the executive staff, the coaching staff, they're high schoolish. And Jameis is limited by all that. But still, has he been that much better than Mariota? Maybe a touch better, but not a whole lot. Maybe both of them are going to have a hard time. So that brings me back to Blake Bortles. I think he's. I think he'll make some plays tomorrow. He can run a little bit. He can't run like Mariota, and he can't do any of. You know, there's no Michael Vick going on in there. He can't make you miss. But six five two forty. He ran at the combine like four eight five, so he can run a little bit. So if, if he gets a clear path, he can take off, and he'll get you 15 yards, and he'll try to run into somebody. But he can throw it well enough, and he's got weapons. D.D. Westbrook, I'm an Oklahoma fan, so he's starting to come alive, and Marquise Lee and Mercedes, and 
They got several other receivers that you all know. I mean, they, they got we enough weapons. They're going to do some damage. And then they got that big old stud back there. And, again, I'm not the biggest Leonard Fournette fan. I used to be. I tried to be. Les Miles once told me he's Jordan-esque before his freshman year. Picked him to win the Heisman. Then he just got thwarted and stymied and shut down twice by Alabama. And I lost a little respect. I don't know if his intangibles are that high, but his ability is through the roof. He can run it, and he can catch it and run it. And he has supreme ability, and I think you're going to see a lot of that tomorrow. But what you're mostly going to see is that Ben Roethlisberger is going to have a hard time. I just think it's going to be a low-scoring game. It's going to be cold. It might be a place kicker game. I said... Josh Lambeau, their little kicker for Jacksonville, would win it on a late field goal and a very tough place to kick. I can't remember what my final was, like 21 to 20 maybe. I'll stick with that, 21 to 20. But I fear them because Tom Brady would have a hard time against Jacksonville. He doesn't know them that well. They can match up. If they want to put Jalen Ramsey on Gronkowski, they could and get away with it. They would cause problems. They can rush the passer. I'm, I'm not sure that Brady would stay upright nearly as much as he did tonight. I don't think he would. Calais is coming, and they, got, they, they come from everywhere. They come off the edge. Fowler comes off the edge. They're, they're really good, and they know they're really good. So I would dread a low-scoring game at Foxborough next week that – that the visiting team could steal. I would feel, fear them more than I would the Steelers. And I think Jacksonville is going to steal this game because I think they're just a little better than a Pittsburgh team. You got Le'Veon talking about next year's contract this week. You got Mike Mitchell saying, we're going to beat the Patriots when we see them again. You got everybody ripping Blake Bortles. And I liked his session that he did with the media the other day. Even though he went LeBron, you know, people say some people say LeBron suck. I guess that's me. He doesn't suck. He just doesn't have the clutch gene. He's a great player without that one thing, clutch gene. Did you see last night? I don't want to get started. Don't get me started on the last play that he failed to make again when he got the switch to six foot one inch Darren Collison and then stepped on the end line and missed the layup. But the point is, Blake Bortles went. LeBron James, like he's comparing himself to LeBron James. You can't do that, Blake. But what I liked was he slammed his fist down and walked off from the media. And it, it wasn't like he was demoralized or defeated. He was angry. And I think he's going to play angry. And I think he's going to play pretty well. I think he'll play about as well as Nick Foles did today against Atlanta. I think he'll make enough plays. Balanced up with Fournette making enough plays, that it's going to be very low scoring, but they're going to hang in and hang on and pull this one off at Pittsburgh. And then we will see. It will be a very intriguing matchup, and it's going to take Tom Brady at his greatest to get by that Jacksonville defense in a game that I don't think it'll get out of the teens. And I hope I'm wrong about that. And I, I would love to see another rematch, you know, re, 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 rematch with Pittsburgh. It would be intriguing just to see if Pittsburgh could finally figure it out, but I don't think they can figure it out because I don't think they're going to figure out Jacksonville. I can't wait. It's going to be a good one tomorrow, and then the late game tomorrow. I picked the Saints to win the NFC before it all started, and I'm going to stick with the Saints. My partner, Shannon Sharp. Picked the Saints before the tournament started, after he had Seattle in the regular season, and he immediately switched to the Atlanta Falcons. No, I think he had the Falcons, but he got the yeah, you know, he had Minnesota beating the Saints. I'm sticking with the Saints, and I know this is a tough one, and I don't feel great about that pick in the second game tomorrow. But I think Alvin Kamara is going to have a big game that he could not have against a Carolina team that just loaded up to stop Kamara and obviously Mark Ingram in the run game for the New Orleans Saints. And this is Mike Zimmer, who earned his spurs in this league, coaching the defensive backfield. When I was covering the Cowboys, he was there coaching the defensive backfield. And I think he will gear his defense to stop or at least slow down Drew Brees. 
And I think you're going to see a lot of Kamara running the ball and catching short passes and turning them into runs that will gash that Minnesota defense. And I think the Saints are going to pull it off with an underrated defense, still a, a top 10 defense against the number one statistical defense in Minnesota. I, I like Case Keenum. I've always liked I liked him at the University of Houston. But this is Drew Brees. This is a statement game for Drew Brees. If you look at it, he's, if memory serves, I had this, I used it on Undisputed on Friday. I think he's 7-5 and five in the postseason. Obviously, he did win one big Super Bowl thanks to a pick six thrown by Peyton Manning. And, of course, an onside kick called to start the second half by Sean Payton. But seven and five, and in his five losses, they're they're kind of ugly losses. They're they're kind of shameful losses to uh, a Rex Grossman in Chicago, and I could go down the whole list. But it's not not a pretty side loss to Alex Smith in San Francisco. <sighs> and there are a couple other ones I can't remember off the top of my head. But they're they're against inferior quarterbacks. He, he beat Nick Foles in, in Philly in 2013, but it's, it's not that impressive. This is a big deal because if he loses to Case Keenum on top of those other sort of shameful losses to inferior quarterbacks, oh, I know what it was, at Matt Hasselback in Seattle, and then the one that he should have lost was to Russell Wilson and the Legion of Boom. That was mismatch. So I give him that one <clears throat> of the – of the losses, one and four. That was it. Matt Hasselback, Alex Smith, Rex Grossman. So this is huge for Drew Brees tomorrow. This is you can't lose to Case Keenum, or you're going to look at his legacy and say, "Really? That's just not a great postseason." Obviously, he's still going to be in the Hall of Fame, but I think it will. It's really going to knock him down the list if he loses to Case Keenum, even though he's up against the number one defense. It would be big feather in, in Hall of Fame cap if he could beat the number one statistical defense in that Thunderdome up in Minneapolis and get, you know, then he would have a – he'd have to go back to Philly and beat Nick Foles a second time, which I think he's capable of doing. So that's what I predicted. It's going to be that rematch of Breeze versus Foles, and I think he could win that one. So it's set up – it sits up perfectly for him. He's got Case Keenum and then potentially Nick Foles, and he's Drew Brees. You better pull this off, my man, as you start to approach that Brady age and stage of your career. And I believe he will. I don't feel nearly as strongly about that game as I did the first one today, tonight's game. And the Jaguars. I feel strongly about the Jaguars pulling it off at Pittsburgh. Can't wait for tomorrow. I will join you live right after the Pittsburgh game and right after the New Orleans game tomorrow ahead of Undisputed on MLK Day, 9.30 to noon Eastern on Fox Sports 1. I better go see if I can get Hazel out of Ernestine's doghouse because I think she's pretty deep in that doghouse. And, you know, it's like good cop, dad bad cop mom. So I need to go make peace. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you definitely for our ratings on Undisputed. We appreciate them very much. We're very excited about them. And I'll be excited to talk to you tomorrow and see you all Monday at 930 Eastern on MLK Day on Fox Sports 1. Undisputed. That's what Tom Brady is. Good night, Facebook.